Welcome to Revelation Ancient Prophecy. This series is a detailed, in-depth study of the book of Revelation. You will discover just how relevant to our day the prophecies of Revelation really are. Here is your presenter, Pastor Byron Neustraten. Well, good evening, and it's good to be here again, and, and thank you for uh, attending and participating in another session of the, the book of Revelation. I, I trust you'll find it most fascinating as, as I do. I mean, I, I really stand here because of my studies on Revelation a long time ago, and I, I love history, and it, I noted that the, the uh, what shall I say, the, the correspondence, the harmony between known history and the biblical predictions are absolutely incredible. Look, could I invite you just to bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here tonight, that we can study your word once again, the book of Revelation. Lord, I pray that you open our minds and our hearts, that we may have a clear understanding, that it may fortify our minds to do your will every day, every time, and follow you more closely. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We are now again, I believe this is number 10, we have been at the trumpets, which we realized was the third outline of uh, time prophecy. And the, four, the first four trumpets were judgments on Western Rome and the Goths, the Vandals, the, the Huns and the Hurali. We went through that. And then we realized that the fifth and the sixth trumpets were also judgments, but they were judgments on Eastern Rome, or as we know it as well as Byzantine Rome, that assisted uh, actually Western Rome, particularly when it became Papal Rome, in the persecution of God's people. If you look at history, this is so well recorded. There were two um, stages. The first one in, in the fifth trumpet was a torment of five months, and we, we went into that with details. And then the second one, in the sixth trumpet, they were capable of killing one third. And I, I alluded to the fact already last week that Western Rome, uh, Eastern Rome, and African Rome made up the total of the Roman Empire. Western Rome was dealt with, with the four trumpets, the first. And then uh, Northern Africa, that was overrun as well uh, by the Justinian armies. And so we really deal with Eastern Rome and the effect of, and we realize this from history, knowing that Constantinople fell on the 16th of May, 1453. And we also looked at the, that sp specific date setting, if you like, on the 11th of August, 1840, which would, uh, did allude to the finish of the ones that were mainly responsible for the realization of what happened to Eastern Rome by way of punishment, that is, of course, the Ottoman Empire, came to an end, came to a conclusive end on the 11th of August, 1840. And that was one prediction that has always fascinated me. We are dealing, of course, as we know, with the rising power of Islam and whilst we all need to respect and uh, accept that people have different opinions and beliefs. The important part is this. If you consider that under the fifth trumpet there was a qualification that the leader of this movement was a fallen angel. And we identify that with the only possibility, and that was Satan. Now, I understand that this would possibly upset a lot of people who believe, who are followers of Islam. Many good people amongst them. But it is interesting, as Muhammad had the, what shall I say, as Muhammad had the divisions, and he got the information that he recorded in the Quran of the able, the angel Gabriel, as he believed it was, I have a question. Was it really the angel Gabriel who advised him and informed him 
Or was it someone impersonating the angel Gabriel? And I would say that Gabriel, who was used in the announcements of some major issues there in the Old and New Testament, would not have contravened scripture. So it's an interesting consideration. It is an interesting consideration. And so the last trumpet is still to come. So technically, even though the Ottoman Empire was finished, the punishment on the Eastern Rome is finished, we, we are technically actually still under the sixth trumpet. Because the seventh one is still to sound. And uh, that comes somewhat later. We have some parenthetical um, uh, writings here, prophecies, that are extremely important before we come to the seventh trumpet. And uh, one of them, which I think is very important to uh, people like us, the, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, is the tenth chapter there of the book of Revelation. The mighty angel and the little book. And I, I wonder if you really will closely follow this. This is important. This is extremely important. It says here, John in vision, can I remind you, 95 AD, he records this. He says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. From heaven means a message from God. Closed with a cloud, now this is interesting, and a rainbow was on his head, this is divinity, this is deity. His face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. Now, if you go to the first chapter of the book of Revelation, you'll find a description of Jesus as a celestial being. And so, this is none other than Jesus. Now, note this, note this. He had a little book open in his hand. Now, open here is, is quite emphatic the way it's placed grammatically in the Greek. It, it, is, it used to be closed but now it's open. So the angel is holding a little book. Bibliaridion means really a little scroll in the Greek language. A little scroll. So he has a little scroll that is open in his hand. And notice, he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So what he has to proclaim must go worldwide because the land and the sea encompasses the whole world. But placing your foot on the land and the sea is also a matter of ownership. He also claims ownership. You might like to think of the book of Ruth where that uh, prevails as a custom amongst the Israelites, how they uh, confirm their ownership. Uh, it's an interesting story. Placing one's foot on the land is ownership. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. So these were voices sounding like thunder. It's fascinating that John understood it. Have a look at this. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. It is audible. John could hear what was conveyed in those seven thunders. But note this. He hears a voice from heaven saying to him, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. Do not write them. Do not write them. And that is amazing. So there was a message that he, that was clearly not for the people in his days, and not until a time when it might become known what it might have meant, and I'll certainly come back to this. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, this is Christ, raising up his hands to heaven, this is important, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, and that is therefore by himself, because he is God, who created heaven and things that are in it, things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, 
This is of course, and the sea and the things that are in it. This is the creator. Jesus is the creator. He is swearing by himself that there should be delay no longer. It's an interesting interpretation. Delay no longer. The Greek word is chronos. I'm more comfortable with this translation. That there should be time no longer. Now let's just hold it there. Is the angel saying to John, as we have traveled through the history of this planet, and we have, we, we have looked at the early part even of the 19th century, uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, that's as far as they went, as we went. Now, is the angel proclaiming here, within that chronology, that there will be no more time? Well, I put it to you, no, that is not what he is saying. And I'll prove it to you in a minute that not for a moment that the angel, that Christ meant that time would stop or cease. And I'll, I'll defend that in a, t in a moment. I believe for certain that the time that we talk about here is an appointed time, an allocated time. I believe that there is a date beyond which we cannot set any dates. And therefore we should not do that either. And I'll certainly, again, I promise I will come back to that. No more time prophecy would be the only possible explanation. No more time prophecy. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, so that is in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sign. Now we have to be very careful what is, what is being recorded here. In the days, note this, of the sounding of the seventh angel, one more trumpet to come, when he is about to sound. He hasn't sounded yet, but he is about to sound. Note this, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared it to his servants the prophets. Now I do believe this deserves a very careful consideration. The mystery of God. You know there are a number of mysteries recorded in the Bible and they're called mysteries because boy it's so hard to grasp, to understand. There is the mystery of iniquity. Sin should have never occurred. You know, it began in heaven, in heaven, of all places. It began with the one who had the highest intellect of all created beings. There was no reason for it. I, I like the quotation of Ellen White. She said, to find an explanation would be to find an excuse. There's no explanation and there's no excuse. Sin should have never happened in heaven, and it should have never happened in here, this planet. It should have never occurred, but it did. It did. Mystery of iniquity. Opposed to that is the mystery of God. I'm going to put it to you that the mystery of God, and I, I, I don't know a commentator who would not agree with this, is the plan of salvation. That to me is a mystery too. God loves us. And he wants to save us, you and me. So this is a mystery. The mystery of God would be finished. Now when would the mystery of God be finished? The mystery of God would be finished when the decision who can be saved and will be saved has been determined. That is when the mystery of God is finished. You could say when the close of probation has become a fact. When the intercession of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary has ceased. That is when the mystery of God is finished. As he declared it to his servants, the prophets. This is why it's so important that you and I study the prophets, the prophecies. There's so many of them in the Bible. In fact, I think of Amos, the prophet Amos, the third chapter, verse 7. I love this statement. 
Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret, his mystery if you like, to his servants, the prophets. That means how you will be saved. The fact that he conveys to his prophets the events as they will unfold on this planet is, an, is a gift, is a provision of God for us that we may know what to expect. And that uh, there is an affirmation that he knows the end from the beginning. And so the Bible has been completely accurate on this. It is amazing. So God reveals his secrets, his mystery to the prophets who then pass it on to the people. And uh, that is God's provision. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said this. Go, that's interesting, from a passive observer who is now a recorder, he becomes a participant. You could say that John is now acting a part in the prophecy that we are about to study here. Go take the little book, it's a little scroll, which is open, it now is open, in the hand of the angel, when a scroll is open, a book is open, it means that you can read and understand what's in it. If it is closed, you can't. And so, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth, the message, the little scroll that is open, is given by Christ to John, who now plays a role, and I put it to you, that John becomes a, an actor on the stage of the prophetic uh, prediction. And this is, this is interesting. So I went to the angel, he said, and I said to him, give me the little book. And I'm sure he said, please, give me the little book. And he, Christ, the, ba the mighty angel, said this to him, take and eat it. Take and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter. Note, please follow this very closely. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Now, in other words, it's a strange saying, eat a scroll, eat a book. But we have a saying like that in English. If someone is a fervent reader, we, we say that they devour books. They don't devour books, but they study it, they internalize it, they remember it. Of course, what we are dealing with here is a, is a internalizing of the significance of the writings of that little scroll which is now open was closed before is now to be understood which came from the hand of none other than Jesus and that is what he gives John and he says there will be an experience of a bittersweet nature now when you eat it it first is in the mouth, sweet as honey. And then as it gets to the stomach, it becomes bitter. It's like, it's like eating something that you shouldn't eat. It can be very tasty, but then it sits there in your stomach. And it doesn't feel right. And you wish you hadn't eaten it, whether it's due to calories or whatever. You regret it, but it's too late. So there is a bitter, sweet experience, sweet as honey in the mouth, but bitter, bitter in the stomach. There's going to be a bitter experience at the end. Then John says, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. He follows the instruction and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, when I had eaten it, he said, my stomach became bitter. Just as the angel had predicted. You and I, 
in the chronology that we are observing here in the book of Revelation and in which it guides us, need to be able to place this bittersweet experience as experienced by John, who obviously personifies a people, the human uh, participation in this process, we have to find an application of something that was sweet to begin with, but ended up in a very bitter experience, and we will certainly come to that, because there is such an occurrence in the time frame that we are dealing with. And then this verse, this is really good. Then he said, then he said to me, you must, to John, you must prophesy again. Now, if you must prophesy again, it means you have prophesied before. Would that be correct? Yes, it would be. So, so there, is a, there is a prophecy. There is something that is as sweet as honey in your mouth. I, I dare say that that is the contents of the prophecy. But then something happens, there's a bitter experience. And what could be more bitter than giving a, prof a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass? It doesn't happen. I, I think of the prophet Jonah who went to Nineveh. 40 days and Nineveh would be destroyed. He was kind of looking forward to that. And he was bitterly disappointed when that particular prophecy, as he understood it, did not find place, because God is merciful. Interesting. So we're looking at a prophecy that was given that clearly must not then have found place, for whatever reason, and that then becomes a bitter experience. I think this is a beautiful allegory, and when we go into the reality of the, the historical application, you'll see it absolutely fits like a glove. You must prophesy again about many people, too many people, nations, tongues, and of course, kings or kindreds as well, and some uh, um, expressions. It's interesting. The prophecy that was given has to be given again. Notice. It has to go worldwide. So God is giving, Jesus is giving a commission to John to prophesy again. And that prophecy, which is the same prophecy, must be given again and it must be given worldwide. That is the commission. And so, how are we to understand this? Let's summarize a few things. What is the little book that is now open in the hand of the angel who is Christ? What are the seven thunders? That always used to intrigue me. That uttered their voices. And, and, and why was John not allowed to write them? I will definitely will come back to that. Because I do have thoughts on that. That there should be time no longer, clearly, does not mean the end of time. Because we just read that John received the commission to what? Prophesy again. Well, what is the point of prophesying again after also having the bittersweet experience if there's no more time? So clearly it's not a matter of time, it is set times designated times, prophetic times, and when we delve into this message further, you'll find there is a very clear application. So, when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, we read, the mystery of God is finished. And so what happens? There is a close of probation. This is important. There is going to be a close of probation, a close of the ministration of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary for the, for the people, for the human race. When that is finished, when that is finished, the 
trumpet is uh, going to sound, but this is an, an, a stage just before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and I might as well tell you that the seventh trumpet is the physical coming of Christ. He did say that he was going to come back again, and we know that. And so this is a little time before the second coming. Now, taking and eating the little book, well, that is studying. I, I, I can't tell you how important this is. And I'm grateful that you that you hear that you that you're willing to study and listen. To me, there is nothing more important than to understand the God we worship and his will for us. And you're only going to do that if you study. Very important. A bittersweet experience. Are we going to look at it? And you'll see, as I said, I promised, it fits like a glove. And then this, that we have to deal with this one too. You must prophesy again. You must prophesy again and worldwide as well. What is the little book open in the angel's hand? Let's go to that first. Well, here it is. I believe for certain that this is the book of Daniel. The whole book of Daniel? No, not the whole book of Daniel. Because what happened is that little book was open. It was open in the hand of the angel of Christ. It wasn't before, therefore, I'm looking at a portion anywhere in the Bible, and I certainly find that in the book of Daniel, where there is a portion that was sealed, which would become plain later on in Earth's history. And that is exactly what we're finding in the book of Daniel. Let's just start having a look at it. Book of Daniel. We go back um, some six and a half centuries. And it's fascinating. Love the book of Daniel. That is the angel Gabriel. And uh, Daniel records, he, um, the angel, he came near to where I stood. And when he came, I, oh, he said, I was afraid. I mean, this is a celestial being. Fell on my face, he did. Fell on his face. And he said to me, he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision, the vision, now let, let me stop there for a moment. In the Hebrew language, there are two words for vision. The one that we're dealing with here is chazon. The other one that we will be dealing with, and that's important, is the mare. The chazon is a vision that you see before you. You see it happening. This is part of a vision that he, you understand, Daniel has seen many visions, a number of them, that, and they are recorded there in his book. Uh, he, this particular vision finds place um, on the eastern portion of the, of the territory of Babylon, uh, a river, the Uli, but we don't know precisely where that was. And he sees celestial beings. And he hears conversations and it conjures up questions in his mind that he would want to understand. And then the angel is sent to him, Gabriel. He's directed towards Daniel in this vision to explain to him certain things. But you know what's interesting? Daniel did not understood everything that he saw and heard. He couldn't quite get his mind around it. Let me explain something about Daniel. The year is 548 BC. What is on the mind of Daniel is his beloved city, Jerusalem. What is on the mind of Daniel is the concern that the temple, the Solomonic temple, has been destroyed. 
which occurred in 586 BC. So we have some 40 years, good 40 years, that the temple lies in ruin. And he wants more than anything else, more than anything else, he wants the temple to be restored so they can have that temple services. And not only that, that God will be dwelling amongst his people again. His desire is for his people to go back, to restore, rebuild Jerusalem. That is what he wants. That is in his mind. That's his prayer. That's his desire. He is jealous for the name of God, the house of God in ruins. This is terrible. And so that is what he is hoping with every fiber of his body. Daniel was a godly man. So we have here the chazon. That's what we're dealing with. I'll explain later on what the mare means, which is a vision, but not a pictorial vision. It is a spoken conveyance of facts, which we will come to later on. And so as he continues to see, he is advised that this chazon refers to the time of the end. Now I have to explain this very carefully because the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel are sister books. I actually put it to you, it would be very advantageous if you study the book of Daniel first and then go to the book of Revelation. They have so much in common. Both books deal with the history of this planet for not just hundreds, but thousands of years. And they deal with the same, same time frames. It's just that Revelation starts somewhat later and gives us far more detail for the end time where you and I live. Now, the time of the end is a very interesting expression in Hebrew. You will find this particular expression, uh, and it, the, the better translation is that the vision belong, the angel said, Gabriel said, to the time of the end. And I know you can't read what it says there in Hebrew. Eight kets means a portion of time before the end. So it is not the end of time. That little expression that in the Hebrew, it gets, is only to be found in the book of Daniel. And you find it a number of times, about five times on the top of my head. Now this is interesting. This vision, the whole pictorial vision, will end up at some time just before that little period of time that's called the time of the end. It's not the end of time. It is a portion of time before the end. And we're going to qualify that further as we go through. It's important that we understand that one. Now, he sees a vision. The ram which you saw, the angel is explaining this to him. Having the two horns, this is Medo Persia, by the way. These are the kings of Medo Persia. Now, this prophecy is given in about 548 BC. The reality of the Medo Persian Empire to come on the world stage is still a few decades away. So, the two horns, the dual empire, the dual kingdom of the Medes and Persians, who ruled for a few hundred years. They actually conquered Babylon in 539 BC. Now here is something more interesting. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Now, it's tempting to go in all the details, but this Grecian power, I, I love the, I love the uh, what shall I say, the, the allegory of the goat, because the Grecians were known as the, go the goats people. In fact, you have the Aegean Sea, now, Aegis means Greek, in, in the Greek language, means, of course, goat. 
They were known as the goats people. Now this is a few hundred years away because he conquered Alexander the Great, and you know that history. He conquered the Medes and Persians in 331 BC. That is more than 200 years away from this. But here is the explanation. Here is the explanation of Gabriel. He says the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. He names the entity. And he says, the large horn that is between its eyes, and you may know this already as well, is the first king. It is fascinating that the first king of the Grecian Empire was Alexander the Great. Now I know that his father, Philip of Macedon, he, he, he combined the separated states from the, from the Grecians and he made it one entity, but he never proclaimed himself king. The one who did that was Alexander. And so that's the first king. And then the Bible goes on to say that the big horn was broken at its zenith of its power, which is historically so correct. The fact that we have uh, a division of four, that the empire did not go to his posterity. This is all predicted hundreds of years before it actually occurred exactly, exactly as the Bible says. And as for the broken horn, as for the broken horn, and the four that stood in its place, the four warring generals that took the position there, Cassandra, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, they were their names, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation. And that is absolutely true. That's exactly what happened. But not with its power. Nobody equaled the authority, the power, the capacity of Alexander the Great. And out of one of them, that is out of one of the four directions of the, of the, of the winds, uh, there, there is a little horn which grew, now note this, exceedingly great, exceedingly great. Now we know that the power that came after Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, uh, uh, that succeeded the, the Grecian powers was greater than the power of Alexander the Great. The Roman Empire ruled the then known world for at least, almost, in fact, six and a half centuries. Amazing, amazing. And then disappeared, which was also predicted by the same prophet, Daniel. So now this power is exceedingly great. It goes towards the south, it conquered Egypt, towards the east, and it had tremendous successes. And it also, in 64 BC under Pompey, it marched into, of course, Jerusalem, and it annexed Judea into the Roman province of Syria, towards the glorious land where the Jews lived. It grew up to the host of heaven, know this, it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground. Now, the, 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 the casting to the ground is an Hebraic expression of rejection. It is not necessarily a physical positioning. It is really a rejection and trampled them. Persecution. So we have persecution. We have a persecution that finds place in a horizontal way. Now, would this be pagan Rome? Yes, initially, most definitely, there for a few centuries in, in intermittent stages and of intensity, there were Roman pagan persecutions. But things changed. We have studied that Rome came to an end, pagan Rome. 476 AD. Remember, Odeca and the Herli took over. Now, Somewhat later, in the year 538, when the last of the Aryan barbarian tribes were defeated by the Justinian armies, the Bishop of Rome exerted himself. And from that era, 538 AD, as history tells us, you get a prominence, a dominance, and uh, yeah, a very, uh, what shall I say, a, a very, uh, misplaced authority, wanting to control the minds of the people, you get a papal entity. Now, I know these are strong words, and they may not be quite politically correct, as they would say today, 
But you know, the wonderful thing about the Bible is it calls things by its name. It describes this entity in the form of a little horn. And uh, the first stage of the little horn in Daniel 8 is pagan Rome. There is a next stage when Rome changes into papal Rome. And historically confirmed that. And then it deals with the people of God exactly the same way as you find the little horn as described in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. So what we find here, notice, from a horizontal action against God's people, from a, he exalted himself, that's the little horn power, who now becomes he. He exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. That always reminds me what happened in heaven. There was an angel, Lucifer, who wanted to be like the most high. I think the root that all sin lies the reality when someone somehow wants to be their own God. And uh, so we have an entity that now lifts itself up as high as the prince of the host. And, and, and we're still in the chazon part of the vision, by the way. We now have a vertical action, a vertical action against the prince of the host, which is Christ. And so, and so we have... The, by him, the daily sacrifice, as it says in your Bible. Now, you note on the screen that the word sacrifice is in italics. Why? The word doesn't belong there. In the original, in the original Hebrew, because chapter 8 is, comes to us in the Hebrew, it doesn't say sacrifice. There's a word for it in Hebrew called tamid. And that tamid means continual. So the continual was taken away. Now I have to explain this a bit. And I'm sorry that it is so complex, but it's worth it. You need to understand this. So there's an entity that puts itself in the place of God. It's an entity that removes the continual. The continual, what continual? Well, the continual and the place of his sanctuary, which was cast down. Cast down is rejected. You remember that. And so his sanctuary is not the sanctuary of the little horn because he has no sanctuary. His sanctuary is the sanctuary of the prince of the host. That is Christ's sanctuary in heaven. Do you understand that? Christ, when he went back to heaven, that was the beginning. And you, in fact, we talked about this in the early chapters of the, uh, of the book of Revelation, chapter 5, the inauguration of the lamb that was slain, that is Christ becoming the priest for us, the human race in heaven. And this is... Um, very important. This entity that now comes into power, we're now talking about the 6th century AD. This power now removes the prerogatives of the function of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. You have to see that. That's what it does do. Now, what was the continual, the tamid, in Hebrew. Now I could dwell a long time on the sanctuary and it would be worthwhile to study it. But every day the petitioner, the sinner, would come to the sanctuary. There would be an offering. And the offering was an expression of faith. Faith in the Lamb of God to come, that someone was going to take the punishment so that we would have another chance, an opportunity to eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. And here is another thing. The other 
element that played a tremendous role was the capacity to resist sin. That is sanctification. We deal with sins committed, we know that. We deal with a sinfulness, like we in principle all are. And we can't overcome our sinfulness by ourselves. The Christian realizes that in heaven we have a priest who helps us to overcome our sinfulness, who sanctifies us, who sanctifies us. That is the Christian walk. Let him work in you and through you, as the Apostle Paul said. Now, that was taken away by the entity that lifted itself up, himself up, to the Prince of the Host. How do you find forgiveness? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. It's not just a fear of punishment. Christ already took the punishment. But you don't want to be lost. You want to be right with God. And so, so God gives you the opportunity. You confess your sins. Your sins are forgiven. That is true. The priest helps you in the sanctuary. This is all before the cross. The cross affirmed the whole system of what we're talking about. And so it was a, a shadow. The, the ministration of the earthly priests was a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus. I hope you understand that. Because once Jesus became our priest, our heavenly high priest, there was no need for any other priests. A priesthood, the only priesthood that helps the believer is the priesthood of Christ. Now, if you were Satan, you would distort, hide, obscure, misinterpret that portion of the plan of salvation, wouldn't you? That's exactly what he's done for hundreds, hundreds of years. And so we have one heavenly high priest who is the only one who can forgive sins. An earthly priest can't. He is the only one who can sanctify us. No earthly institution can do that. Can you see the importance of the mission? Can you see the importance of the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary? It wasn't just Calvary. It didn't finish there. Although it ratified, enabled, very earned also the right not just to forgive you sins, but also work on your sinfulness and change it into a holiness that only he can do. That's the gospel. That is the mystery of God. That's how he saves you, as the sanctuary actually explains. Now, I know this is a long introduction. <laughs> because of transgression, notice, because of what she did, this entity, this little horn power in its vertical uh, era, that means the papal era, an army was given over to the horn. She utilized the secular forces with whom there was a liaison unholy connections who then would oblige by persecuting God's people who wanted to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppress the daily sacrifices. In fact, we understand already that this is the continual. Can I say something here, which I do believe is vitally important? Look. If someone forces a religious belief on you, if someone forces a religious practice on you, can I tell you now, it's not from God. Well, you study the New Testament. Jesus forced nobody. Nobody, never. He never forced anybody. What he wants is for us to make the choice, we make the choice, to connect with him and trust him and follow him, obey him. 
and therefore worship him. Does that make sense to you? The compulsion does not come from God. It doesn't. And he cast truth down to the ground, which is exactly the point that I have been trying to make. There is an obscuring of the truth, a truth that saves us. Remember Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he would lead us into all truth? Well, that is obstructed by the enemy of souls. And he uses entities, and I hate to say this, but he uses human entities to obstruct, to misdirect the people that are searching for salvation. And that's a tragedy. Bible predicted it. He did all this and prospered, and so he did. Now, Daniel is watching this vision as described in the eighth chapter. And we still wish the chazon. How long will the vision be concerning the daily, the tamid, the continual? Remember? The continual, the forgiving of the sins, the ministration of the priest going into the holy place, uh, placing the records perhaps of the sins, but these are forgiven sins. They are recorded there. And he pleads for your by way of intercession for your sinfulness because that is a process of sanctification that only he can do. And so how long will the vision, the chazon, be concerning the tamid, the continual? And the transgression of desolation. Daniel, whose mind is still on the city of Jerusalem. It's still on the temple. They lie in ruins and this is wrong. When will all that be restored? That is on his mind and he's preoccupied. The giving of both the sanctuary and the host God's people to be trampled underfoot. When will they go back and have their services and be the, the chosen people that God set them out to be? And he said to me, for 2,300 days. And we're going to talk about this time frame in the near future much more. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The word there, nitstak, is the only time when you find it in that conjugation. It comes from the word tzedak, which means holy, vindicated or justified. In this, it's in a Passive word form. Something is going to cleanse the sanctuary. I just told you. The blood that was taken into the holy place came from the animal of sacrifice. The animal of sacrifice should be the people. But it isn't because there's forgiveness and it is the Lamb of God to come. And so the interesting thing, the sins were confessed, transferred if you like, they were confessed, and they were transferred if you like to the animal. Then somehow the priest takes the records of the sins that are forgiven, by the way. He takes them to the holy place, but they don't belong there. And he does this day after day continually, tamid. And on one day, the most holy day in the Jewish religious calendar, and we're going to talk about that. You should know about that. Why? Because it involves you too. If you want to know how he saves you, need to study the sanctuary. It's worth it. Once a year, that day was called the Yom Kippur. Kippur comes from the verb kathar, that means to cover. You know, we need to be covered by the righteousness of Christ. And so, we have to surrender. And I want to know how he does that. And the marvelous thing is, that he deals with my sinful record, the sins forgiven, he deals with that in such a way, 
that I in eternity will never have to worry, never have to be concerned about the sins I once perpetrated. They won't come to mind. And not into anybody else's mind either. Wonderful. There is a full restoration. And that's promised to us. The sanctuary needs to be cleansed. The records of the confessed sins, the sins that are forgiven, have now to be taken away from the sanctuary. And God is going to deal with them. And we're going to talk about that, what that process was. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, the 2,300 days. Evenings and mornings means days. Think of Genesis 1 and 2. That is the mare, the 2,300 days is the mare. Now, Daniel hears that. When will it be restored? Oh, 2,300 days. Well, that's about six and a half years. The time of the prophecy is about 548 BC. The restored, rebuilt temple which we often call the Zerubbabel Temple, which later became known as Herod's Temple, wasn't dedicated and finished, much less glory than the Solomonic Temple. It was dedicated in the year 516 BC, and therefore it cannot mean, it cannot refer to this era as a six and a half year time era, because it has nothing to do really, with the earthly sanctuary. And Daniel knows that this is going to be an impossibility. And was he already familiar with the idea of the application of the year day principle? Every commentator that has studied these prophecies, and I can quote the reformers, understood the year day principle which is so easily defended from scripture. If you do that, in prophetic time era, in prophetic time era, you apply the year day principle, everything fits. Everything fits. And as I said, the reformers recognized that. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, 2,300 days become 2,300 years. But can you imagine in the mind of Daniel, 2,300 years before there's a restoration, before the sanctuary will be cleansed, before there is a Yom Kippur that removes the sin away from the people of God. He didn't understand that. And that's the book, the portion of the book he didn't understand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, the mare which is connected with the chazon of the old pictorial events as they were portrayed there before Daniel in vision. The vision of the evenings and the mornings which was told is true. Now note this, here it is. Therefore seal up the vision, the chazon, everything that he saw, including the 2,300 years that are connected with his vision and gives a certain duration. For it refers, the angel says, Gabriel to Daniel, it refers to many days in the future. And he qualifies that. But you, Daniel, shut up the words. Notice, that's in the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Seal the book. Close it. Seal the book until, and there we have it again, the time of the end, eight kids. And I'll defend that, that that actually you can give a certain date to. Because if you look at, if you look at the action of the little horn, it's persecuting. The action in its, of the little horn in its second phase, when it persecutes God's people, which will have to come to an end. And it is remarkable if we identify, identify as did all the reformers, if we identify the little horn power, 
the little horn power from the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel and from the eighth chapter of the book of Daniel in its second phase, the same entity that persecutes God's people came to a definitive end in 1798 when on the 15th of February, General Berthier of the Napoleonic army marches into Rome and takes the then current Pope, Pope Pius VI, prisoner who dies a year and a half later in exile in the south of France. The whole world looked at that and they said, it has come to an end. But you and I, as we're going to continue to study the book of Revelation, we'll find that this power will come back more powerful than ever. That's what the Bible teaches. Many shall run to and fro. The Hebraic expression, many shall run to and fro, is an is a expression, uh, a colloquial expression of examining. Many shall run to and fro. You find that also in the book of Job, when Satan is asked, who do you represent? Oh, I've been to and fro, walking to and fro, examining. And then God, of course, reminds him of Job. Many shall run to and fro, and what? Knowledge shall increase. So we're looking for an era when knowledge increases. Now, we, you and I live in, a, in, in incredible times. Technology just doubles and doubles and triples. <laughs> Mind you, not in everything. As we know in the times that we live in. But the interesting thing is this. The expression here, in the book of Daniel, there, the 12th chapter, primarily, primarily refers, then, the first, in the verse 4, that increase of knowledge refers to the portion of the book of Daniel that was sealed. So in the book of Daniel, there is a prediction that at the time of the end, around 1798, there will be an understanding of the portion of the book of Daniel that Daniel certainly didn't understand. Nobody understood. It was sealed. It was not a message for his people of the day. It would only be revealed at a certain time. And that very specific time is a time frame, a, a portion of time before the end, which we can identify as 1798. That's interesting. And you will see in the accounts of history that we will talk about next week, it fits 100%. Then I heard a man clothed in linen, Daniel 12, 7, who was above the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven. Remember the angel in the 10th chapter, that was Jesus Christ, right? Yes, it was. And he swore by himself. Here in the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, we have the same identity, none other than Christ. Held up his right hand, his left hand to heaven. Swore by him who lives forever and ever by himself that it shall be, notice the persecutions, this is what Daniel wanted to know. It shall be for a time, times, and half a time. In the Hebrew, Moed, Moadim, the equivalent of the Aramaic, Idan, Idanin, and a half, we deal with a three and a half year time period, which is recognized again by all commentators as three and a half years in prophetic terms, three and a half years. In prophetic terms, a month is 30 days. A month in prophetic entities represents 30 years. Times 12 is 360. Times three and a half becomes 1260 years. You will find this time frame in the book of Revelation a number of times. It was the rulership from 538. Now you remember that I have 
pointed out on a number of occasions that in 538 AD, Papal Rome came into its own, exerted itself. The opposition was quelled by the Justinian armies. Till 1798, when General Berthier walked into Rome and took the Pope prisoner. That's an era of exactly 1260 years of a predicted dominance and persecution. That is what happened. History confirms that. It does. When the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Daniel does not understand it. He doesn't. And he wants to know, but he's told, go your way. For the words are what? Closed up, the angel says, Gabriel. And sealed. They are sealed when? Until the time of the end. Which brings us to the chapter in the book of Revelation that we're studying here this, this evening. The tenth chapter of the book of Revelation. The little scroll now open in the hand of Jesus. Sealed till the time of the end. Amazing. Amazing. The little book open in the angel's hand, Christ's hand, is the sealed portion of the book of Daniel to be understood at the time of the end and it is around 1798 and after that this book is going to be really studied and really understood. And so, what does it mean? Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next time because we need to understand this. Vindicated, justified, same word, neat stuck. What were the seven thunders? Oh, we will come back to that. That there should be time no longer. That is prophetic time. There is a culmination to a final date that can be set, but after that, no date setting. We'll come back to that. When the seventh trumpet is about to sound, the mystery of God is finished. We explained that. The plan of salvation comes to a conclusion before Jesus returns. Taking and eating the little book, well, it is internalizing. It becomes a part of you and you become a part of it. The bittersweet experience, I promise you, will give you a full account of that. Must prophesy again, boy, is this important. Because God has commissioned a people, a movement to do just that. And so next week, we'll look at the cleansing of the sanctuary. It's good. What happened on that day, the tenth day of the seventh months? We need to understand that. We will uh, understand more about the judgment in heaven because the cleansing of the sanctuary involved a process of judgment. Very interesting. And it relates to each and every one of us. We'll talk about this man, William Miller. There are others. Uh, besides him, that proclaimed the same message. It was called the Advent Movement. Well, it's not the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We came into being after all of this. It was called the Advent Movement. There were many denominations that uh, made up this tremendous movement because these people were hoping and longing for the return of Jesus and as they studied the Marais part of the, the, the prophecy of Daniel, the 2,300 years, they came into the understanding that they could figure out a date, and we'll talk about that next week, and they could predict when Jesus would return. Although Jesus had said of that day and that hour, no one knows, only his Father in heaven. We look at that. It was an incredible movement, though. And so, I hope you will join me again as we study this, because they made a mistake 
when they set a certain date, believing that Jesus would be back on that date, because they understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary, the earth being the sanctuary they thought, would mean a destruction by fire, and of course we go back with Jesus to heaven. Amazing what they thought, what they taught. Godly people earnestly searching for truth. It took a bit of disappointment because Jesus didn't come. It took a bit of disappointment to lead them into further truth. We'll talk about that. And so as we come to conclusion, can I say that I hope that this presentation here tonight, I know, I know there's a lot of information, but please, it's your salvation. And with the assurance of your salvation, you can convey hope to other people because they can participate in the same salvation. And that's important, isn't it? If you have any questions, we have a website. It'll come on the screen. Please ask. But see you again next week as we go further into the magnificent book, the book of Revelation. May God bless you and may I invite you just to bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can delve into your word and that we get the assurances of your provisions and the wonderful way that you intend and do save us. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, we don't always understand why you love us that much, but we know you do. Help us to love others and express that love by helping them to understand that you are a God who wants to save and does save. So bless us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You've been listening to Revelation Ancient Prophecy with Pastor Baron Neustraten, brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio. For more information on this series, visit waitarachurch.org.au.